Hello fellow plastic fryers. Now this is like the fifth attempt I've made at recording this video. I'm going to be showing you in depth the HPA FCU circuit that I've used in several HPA builds. I've had a few requests to do a detailed guide on this. The problem I did have with this originally is I did actually record me assembling it but it was all completely out of frame and not only that I was actually making up the layout of the circuit as I went along. So not only do you need to know how to solder and read electronic diagrams it also helps to know how to solder onto perf board because there's a bit of a knack to it. But we're going to go over the processes and how I did it anyway. Just quickly, components. You're going to need a 555 timer, 8-pin little timer chip. And this one here is from Texas Instruments. It doesn't have to be Texas Instruments. It just needs to be a 555. You can use an IC socket if you so wish. I didn't bother though. And then you want a power transistor with a current rating of at least an amp. It doesn't need to be much more than that. And it's going to be on for such a brief period of time anyway. You don't really have to worry about it getting hot or being overloaded. And it won't need any sort of cool or heatsink. And you also want a 2.2 microfarad electrolytic capacitor. Now these things are polarized but if you have any idea of how to build the circuit I like to think you would know that these are polarized but just in case negative stripe there. I also recommend that you chuck in a 10 nanofarad polyester capacitor. This goes between pin 5 and ground and it just helps give the voltage divider I believe inside the 555 a bit of extra stability. And you also want two 200k potentiometers with the code 204. And these will allow you to adjust the dwell time and the fire rate. If you're doing a semi-auto only build like what I did with the first Foverint, you can omit one of these. And you want at least one 1K resistor, brown, black, red, gold. Although gold is the tolerance, but brown, black, red is what you want to be looking for. And what I also like to do is I like to have an LED connected to the output of the circuit. So this will flash whenever the solenoid opens. And if you don't want to bother with that LED indicator, you can obviously get rid of it. And you can also get rid of this 1K resistor. So you will only need one, which is just for the base of the transistor. You will also need a minimum of two 1N4001 1 amp rectifier diodes. Now one of these diodes is actually used for the semi-auto timing. If you put one of these between pin 6 and pin 7 of the 555 timer with the cathode connected to pin 6 and the anode to pin 7, that will make the 555 do a single pulse and then you can adjust the on time or in this case the dwell time with one of the potentiometers. And you will definitely need one down here for your flyback protection. Basically this connects across the solenoid. You want to have your cathode which is the grey band going to the positive side of the coil and the anode to the negative. Make sure you get it the right way around otherwise you'll short out the transistor. Basically when the power is cut off to the solenoid you get a massive voltage spike back and if you don't have a flyback diode you're going to end up with a very high voltage going across the transistor which can kill it. And even though this is only a 50 volt diode it seems to be more than man enough to get rid of that spike. I suppose it's such a brief pulse there's not much energy behind it it just dissipates it and gets rid of it. And I also recommend you include another one for reverse polarity protection and this just goes between the positive of the battery and the circuit. So that way if you connect the battery up backwards, it won't blow up the circuit. It won't work, but it won't blow it up. And for connections, I like to use screw terminals. As I mentioned before, the current going through the circuit is very low. It can't be more than an amp or two. You're going to get a bit of inrush current from the solenoid, but it's going to be such a brief pulse that you'd it's just not going to be noticed. So for connections, I like to use power adapter wire because it's quite easy to get a hold of if you've got any old power adapters. Now when I'm building a circuit like this, I like to start at the output end, the switching end, and then work my way back. But just quickly, we're going to have a look at the inputs. We have our positive and our negative and our two trigger connections. Negative just goes straight to the negative connections on the circuit. Positive, though, goes to one side of the trigger contact connectors. Because the way this circuit detects when you pull in the trigger is it simply just powers up the circuit through the trigger. So one of these connections goes to one side of the trigger contacts. The other side of the trigger contacts goes into this one here. And that goes to the positive side of our circuit. So I have a little positive common bus bar here which I've formed by soldering all of the little dots together, although I also have the little reverse polarity protection diode there. And you want the band pointing in the way that you want the electricity to flow. So it's going to come through here when you pull the trigger, go across there and down into this positive bus bar. I know it's not strictly a bus bar, but you know it's a power, power rail, power bus. And one side of that goes straight to the positive side of our solenoid. So the solenoid is screwed into here. Because this circuit uses an MPN transistor, it switches the negative side of the load, which in this case is our solenoid and also our little LED. Speaking of the LED, we want to put one of our 1K resistors between that and positive. So we connect one side of the resistor to the positive common connections. And the other end of the resistor goes to the positive of the LED. And that's that little blob right there. And as you can see, the LED has a flat spot here on the right. Normally that denotes negative, but not on this one, of course not. That side's positive. 
If you get one of those little CR2032 3 volt lithium cells, you can use that to check the polarity of the LED. And before we go any further, we want to take our flyback diode, so one of our 1N4001s, we want to connect the cathode, the grey band, straight to the positive common. And then the anode, the other side, wants to go to the negative of the LED and the negative of this screw terminal. The diode leg I formed to make the connection. So the diode soldered in there, connects to the LED there, and then goes to the negative side of the solenoid screw terminals. And then what you want to do is you want to take your transistor and you want to make sure you get the pin out right. Pin outs may vary. In this case, we have base, collector, emitter. So the collector is the middle pin and that goes to the negative side of this little circuit we built earlier. So in this case, it goes straight onto the cathode side of the diode. And if we look at the far right pin of the transistor, which is the emitter, this has to go to the battery negative. And if we flip it over, you can see using solder, I formed a track to the negative connection. So this little negative track here is another little common connection. It's a bit fiddly trying to join the little pads together to form tracks. But to start off with, you want to work out the path that you want to take. And then you put a blob of solder on each track leading up to where it wants to go. And then if you put the soldering iron between the pads and quickly apply a bit of solder, and it sometimes helps to blow, you can form a bridge between two pads. And if you do it all the way around, that's how I get these nice little tracks. Of course, I can't make a track jump over another one, so that's where I use these insulated wires. So now we have the negative side of the transistor connected to the negative of the circuit. Then we want to connect our remaining 1K resistor to the remaining pin on the transistor, which in this case is the base located on the far left. This is the connection on the transistor, which actually tells the transistor to turn on. Of course, if you know what I'm talking about, that's going to be incredibly patronizing, but you never know. And before we go any further with that, we're going to move over to this side of the circuit here. Now, the 555 is an integrated circuit, so it does look quite daunting, but it really isn't that bad. So you want to put it in place on the board, like I have done so here. And when it comes to the pins of a 555, sometimes you have a tiny little dot in the top left-hand corner here. But in this case, we don't, but we have this side marked with this little notch. So pin one is this top left-hand pin here. Pin two, pin three, pin four pin 5, pin 6, pin 7, pin 8. Pin 1 is ground, pin 8 is positive, pin 3 is the output. So once you've got this chip in place, you can then connect pin 3 via a little solder track to the other side of the resistor down here. So if we flip it over like this, pin 3 is there. So this one here is pin 3, and it goes down to here which is the other side of the resistor. And I will say, just quickly, you don't need to worry too much about using a really fancy iron to do this because if I did it with this crappy old 30 watt Antex iron, which is like half my age, I'm sure you can manage it. Not only do you need to connect the external components to the 555, you also have to connect a few pins together. Pin 4, which is this top one here, and pin 8 must be connected together. Although because pin 8 is where you put the positive power into the chip, you can also just get away with putting pin 4 to the positive common as we mentioned earlier. Now pin 8 is soldered here, but what I've done is I ran a trace of solder down to here, which is pin 4. So pin 4 and pin 8 are connected together like this. And then to get positive to both of them, I then connected a piece of insulated wire and took it over to the positive common rail. I keep saying common rail and that's going to confuse people in the mechanics trade because I'm pretty sure common rail is a type of diesel injection system. We can go to the second set of inter-pin connections where we want to connect pin 2 to pin 6. So that's pin 1, this is pin 2, and we have 8, 7 and 6. And to connect pin 2 to pin 6, I used a piece of insulated wire like so. And it goes over the little trace we've got for pin 4 and pin 8. And at this point, we also want to connect pin 1 down to our common ground. So where you have the emitter connected on the transistor, we can then run a wire down to there and then this can form your negative common. And then with the electrolytic capacitor, you want to connect the positive to pin two, and then the capacitor shares a ground with pin one, so you can connect it straight to pin one where we connected the ground moments ago. Then we're gonna go over to this side here, and what we want to do is we want to connect the potentiometer between pin eight and pin seven. The reason why we're going to pin 8 is because that's connected to positive voltage and also it's right next to pin 7 so that just makes things easier. And with the potentiometer you have three pins. You have two pins down this end and you have the wiper pin. You'll need one of these pins and the wiper pin. So if we turn it over again, this is pin 8. We've connected that straight over to one side of the dwell time potentiometer. And then we take the wiper pin and we run a trace of solder 
down to pin 7. And then you want to take your remaining 1N4001 diode and you want to put the anode to pin 7 and then you want to take the cathode which is the banded end and you want to connect that to pin 6. So if we flip it over it's been soldered directly alongside the chip and then we just bridged the solder over to it to connect it to the chip. Next up, we're going to take our 10 nanofarad polyester capacitor. This is non-polarized, so you don't need to worry about it blowing up if you connect it wrong. And we're going to connect it to pin 5, which is this one here. And then we want to connect the other side of the capacitor to our common ground. And if we ignore these components down here, and of course you then got to put your little connections on for your trigger, your power, and your output, you're actually done if you want to do a semi-auto only build. But where's the fun in that? Now you have to have a little micro switch inside your gearbox to detect when your selector switch is on full auto. Ideally you want the circuit to close when you put the selector onto full auto. And what that does is it bridges the diode out of the circuit with this second potentiometer here. So what I did in this case is I connected this leg here of the potentiometer to pin 6. This little blob here goes up to pin 6. For reference, this connection right below it is the pin 5 to the capacitor. So pin 6, the actual chip pin, is right there. So once you've soldered pin 6 to one side of the potentiometer, we're going to take the wiper pin and we're going to run it down this track here. And these two tracks are not actually connected to each other. And this track from the wiper pin goes down to one side of your selector micro switch. And then you want to run the other side of this up to pin 7. And what we actually do is we take the trace up to the wiper pin of the first potentiometer because if you remember correctly, that goes straight over to pin 7. So as mentioned before, without this connected together, you just have semi-automatic. As soon as you connect these two connections together, you have full auto and you can set the fire rate with this potentiometer. Although you do have to somewhat tune both of them up to get the right dwell time and fire rate. They sort of somewhat rely on each other. Now there is a knack to building circuits on perfboard. And when it came to me actually building this circuit, I didn't actually know if I was going to be laying it out like this. I had no idea how I was going to do it. I just made it up as I went along. But I do recommend you start off with the switch inside first and work your way back. And then if we flip it over actually on video I'm hoping that you can use this as reference we turn it over like that bear in mind pin 8 is the top right pin so it's now the top left pin and you have positive negative positive goes straight over to one side of the trigger and then the other side of the trigger goes to the positive common positive feed goes over to the pin 4 and pin 8 connections we have a pin 1 connection down to a common ground. Ground also goes to the emitter of the transistor and also goes to one side of the little 10 nanofarad capacitor. The collector of the transistor goes to the negative side of an LED and also to the anode of the flyback diode and the cathode of the flyback diode goes to the positive. And then the positive connects to the LED via the 1K resistor. The positive goes up to one side of the screw terminal and the negative from the collector, which is connected to everything else at this point, goes to the other side to form the negative. The negative of the electrolytic 2.2 microfarad capacitor goes to pin 1, which is of course connected to ground and the positive goes to pin 2, which is connected to pin 6. Pin 8 and pin 7 are joined together through the wiper pin and one of the other legs of the dwell time potentiometer. Pin 7 and pin 6 are joined together with a diode with the band pointing towards pin 6 and the anode, the opposite end, connected to pin 7. And as we mentioned before, pin 5 connected to the other side of the 10 nanofarad capacitor and of course the other side goes to the common negative. This is going to be fun editing it, isn't it? And then for the full auto, you want to connect one side of the terminal block, which goes to one side of the selector switch, to pin 7. And then the other side of the terminal block wants to go to one of the pins on the potentiometer. In this case, I've chosen the wiper pin because it lines up nicely. And then one of the other pins of that potentiometer goes to the pin 6 of the 555. And also make sure that you have your reverse polarity protection diode with the anode going to positive and the cathode going towards the positive side of the circuit. If you want to put a fuse on this, put a one amp automotive blade fuse in, that should be enough. So the negative of the battery goes here, positive there. Your trigger contacts go there. Your selector contacts or selector mic switch go there. Positive of your solenoid goes here and the negative of the solenoid goes here. You adjust your dwell time with this one here and your full auto time with this one here. And that is how I made my HPA FCU. If you found this video useful, then please make sure you leave a like. And I know I'm going to be getting questions, so make sure you leave them down in the comments. And if you want to be part of the channel, then please make sure you subscribe too. But if you want to see the end product, if you want a bit of motivation, then make sure you check out the Fovereen in action right here.